So thank you all for coming. We have five papers that we are going to have presented and no discussants. So we'll have the presenters present for about 15 minutes and then follow that with uh, eight minutes of discussion or so. And um, hopefully we can improve our, our papers that way. So um, our first paper is by Xiaochen Zhao and co-authors, and it's on wealth inequality and returns in COVID. Um, thanks for including this paper on the program. This is joint work with Katya Katshofa, who is joining me here today. During the COVID-19 pandemic, US household wealth first declined, then recovered quickly, and has been growing at an even faster rate than before the pandemic. This looks quite different from what happened during the Great Recession, when the decline in household wealth was more severe and the recovery was much slower. So this is a level of household wealth. What about the distribution? This figure shows that the share of wealth accounted for by the wealthiest 1% households has increased to the highest level in at least a few decades. In other words, wealth inequality also increased later in the pandemic. So our paper tries to address the question of what explains the dramatic changes in the US top 1% wealth share during the COVID-19 period. We're going to argue that the key to understanding the dynamics of wealth inequality is the dynamics of the rate of return to wealth. Why is that? Well, um, at any specific point in time, wealth is equal to the return on the initial wealth plus the savings over the period. Now, if we divide both sides by the initial wealth, what we have is that the growth rate of wealth is equal to the rate of return plus the saving rate. The rising top 1% wealth share means that the wealth of the wealthy is growing at a faster rate than the wealth of other households. Now, according to this equation, this can only come from a higher rate of return of these households or a higher saving rate of these households or both. However, within a short period of time, changes in savings are too small compared to overall wealth, especially when there are large asset price movements. So this makes the rate of return the key determinant for the gross rate of wealth and hence wealth inequality. So in order to explore this return channel of wealth inequality, our paper addresses four specific questions. First, how has the wealth return evolved during COVID-19 in the aggregate and for households in different parts of the wealth distribution? Second, what drives heterogeneity in the wealth return across households and over time? Third, how has the wealth return evolved for different ratio groups? And finally, to what extent heterogeneity in the wealth return can explain changes in the top wealth share as opposed to heterogeneity in the saving rate? In the interest of time today, I'm going to focus on the first three questions. As you see, one of the key steps for us to answer these questions is to estimate the wealth return for different households. How do we do that? Well, the wealth return is just the weighted average of returns on individual assets minus the weighted average cost on individual debt. So as long as we know the weights, which are just the portfolio shares of these assets and debt, and they are returns, then we can estimate the wealth return. So we need a bottom-up approach. We're going to measure um, the annual return at monthly frequency. For example, in order to measure the return in December 2020, we need to know the portfolio shares of assets and debt in December 2019 and the returns on these assets and debt over the period of December 2019 to December 2020. So now let me show you how we measure these portfolio shares and the returns on these assets and debt, and then we'll see the patterns in the wealth return. We use the Survey of Consumer Finances SCF 2019 data to measure uh, portfolio shares. This data were collected right before the pandemic. This figure shows the asset portfolio of the average household. For them, primary residence, stocks, and private businesses are the most important assets, together accounting for about 70% of total assets. I don't have the figure for debt portfolio here, but the um, debt to asset ratio for the average household is about 13%. In terms of the return um, on an individual asset or debt, well, in general, the return is equal to the yield plus the capital gain. The yield of an asset is just the flow income 
generated by the asset during the period divided by the initial asset value. Since we don't have data on household specific yields over the pandemic, we designed three-step procedure to estimate it. In the first step, we use SCF data to estimate household specific pre-pandemic yields of the asset. In the second step, we use aggregate data on capital income and capital stock to uh, construct the aggregate of the yield of the asset, which are available in real time. In the last step, we multiply the household specific pre-pandemic yields by the growth rate of its aggregate counterpart. So the underlying assumption of this procedure is that differences in the yield across households were mainly driven by the differences in the yield before the pandemic rather than the growth rate of the yield over the pandemic. This um, seems to be a reasonable assumption when we look at historical data. In terms of the capital gain, we mainly rely on the growth rate of various stock price indices and house price indices. So now let me show you the returns on three major assets. Well here, um, as you see, uh, stocks and private businesses both experienced a sharp decline early in the pandemic. Um, uh, Later, uh, their returns start to increase. In contrast, the housing market never collapsed, so the return on housing was essentially flat, but it started to increase after the second quarter of 2020. So with all of these pieces, we're ready to answer the first question, how has the wealth return, which is the weighted average of returns on individual assets and debt uh, evolved? So according to our estimates, before the pandemic, the annual wealth return uh, was 8%. Early in the pandemic, it fell sharply to below zero, and then it started to increase. By the end of the first year of the pandemic, in February 2021, it already increased to 13%. We know the exact drivers behind these changes, where well, the initial decline was almost entirely driven by falling equity returns. The later increases were driven by both housing returns and equity returns. Now, more interestingly, is the return for different um, household groups. So here, the red line is the returns for top 1% households. These households experienced a much more dramatic decline in the return early in the pandemic, but the later increases were also stronger. In contrast, when we look at people in the lower end of the wealth distribution, for example, this blue line, these households did not experience much of a decline in the return early in the pandemic, but the increases in the return later were also uh, moderate. Overall, we find that when returns are rising, wealthy households tend to earn higher returns than less wealthy households. So how to explain this heterogeneity? Well, there are mainly three sources. The first one is large differences in household portfolios. The second one is large asset price movements. The third one, which is less obvious on this figure, is that even um, in a specific asset category, some households tend to earn higher returns than others. So what I'm going to do now is to show you each sources of heterogeneity, and then we'll use counterfactual analysis to see uh, which sources are um, indeed important for return heterogeneity. So the first source comes from substantial differences in household portfolios. So here we see that for households in the lower end of the wealth distribution, primary residence and the vehicles are the main assets for them. When we move to the middle part of the distribution, primary residence is the single most important assets. When we move up along the distribution, stocks, which are the red bars, are more important, and also private businesses, which are in uh, green bars. When we look at the portfolio for the top 1% households, private businesses are the most important assets, followed by stocks, and housing only account for less than 10% of their total um, portfolio. The second source we already kind of seen earlier is that there are large asset price movements within a short period of time, which paired with uh, portfolio differences can potentially create uh, heterogeneity in the return across households. But there's one more source. So here what we see is that for a specific asset category, such as interest and earning assets, stocks, investment and housing, and private businesses, Wealthy households tend to earn higher returns than less wealthy households. Now, in terms of debt, here the numbers are negative, meaning the cost of debt. Well, again, wealthy households tend to pay lower costs on their debt. Now, one thing that is different 
um, is that we find during uh, later periods of uh, the COVID, uh, people who are at the lower end of the wealth distribution tend to earn higher return on housing than wealthier households. Well, this is mainly because less wealthy households tend to own less expensive homes. During COVID, it is this less expensive or startup homes that gain higher increase in the house price. But overall, the difference across household is small. So now, uh, after seeing all three sources of potential heterogeneity, we want to use counterfactual analysis to see which ones are indeed important in generating return heterogeneity. We're going to measure return heterogeneity using the gap between top 1% and bottom 99% households in their returns. So as you see uh, uh, this black line, early in the pandemic, the uh, return gap fell, but then it increased later. So in the first counterfactual, what we did is to shut down the within category differences in the returns. That is, we give everyone the same return for a specific asset or debt category as for the average household, but we do allow people to have different portfolios and we let asset prices to move as in the data. As you see, this channel um, uh, does not uh, create uh, much for the return gap, which means this is not um, a driver for return heterogeneity. What is important um, is the portfolio differences. So here we shut down this channel by giving everyone the same portfolio as for the average household, but we do maintain the other two sources of heterogeneity. And as you see, this essentially removed all the variation in the return across households. Well, there's one more dimension, which is the time variation in the return gap. So here we shut down the asset price channel by letting um, the asset price growth to be the same as in the pre-pandemic level, as you see, we essentially removed all of the time variation in the return heterogeneity. Well, there's still a constant heterogeneity in the return. This is mainly driven by the fact that uh, wealthy households tend to own assets that earn higher returns in general. Okay, so now let me use the rest of time to talk about um, the implications for the ratio groups. So we estimated the wealth return for different ratio groups. Now here, the red line is the return for white households and the, the, the blue lines for black households. As you see, both experienced an initial decline uh, followed by later increases. But the change for white households were more dramatic than for black households. When you look at these two lines, you realize that they actually look like the returns for wealthier households and less wealthier households. In fact, when we plot the gap in the return between white and black households, which is this gray line, it looks quite similar to the return gap between top 1% and bottom 99% households. So this raises a question of to what extent this ratio return gap is driven by differences in wealth and in portfolios. So in order to answer that question, um, uh, we turn to household level analysis. We look at household level returns. In the first column, we only um, include ratio dummies. As you see, we see a clear uh, return gap between white and black households and also between white and Hispanic households. In the second column, we control for households position in the wealth. As you see, the heterogeneity coming from the race dimension started to um, uh, decline, uh, to diminish. In the third column, we control for both wealth and portfolio differences. And in the fourth column, we control, in addition, the demographic variables such as education um, and age. And we don't see significant heterogeneity coming from race itself. So this results just says that the return gap we see earlier here mainly capture the differences in household wealth and differences in household portfolios. Once we control for that, we don't see race itself contribute to return heterogeneity. Okay, so now um, let me conclude. Well, a large number of studies um, focused on um, the drivers of long-term wealth distribution. Our paper focuses on short-term wealth dynamics. This is important from the policy point of view, and this is also because temporary shocks to wealth can have more persistent effect. So in order to understand this short-term wealth inequality dynamics, we um, design methods to estimate wealth returns. We show that there are large return uh, heterogeneity across households, which were mainly driven by portfolio differences and asset price movements. And finally, regarding the ratio wealth inequality, which is a problem we all uh, care about here today, 
uh, our paper stresses the importance of um, wealth returns. So if policies could help black households to increase their overall return, such as encouraging them to invest in high return assets, help them to restructure their debt or help them to refinance their mortgages can all increase their overall return and hence help to reduce um, racial wealth um, gap. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you. Um, so do we have any questions? You can raise your hand using the, uh, the tool down there and call on you. Or you can put it in chat. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. So if we have, uh, if we don't have any questions, do you, do you want to say anything else, uh, Shoshan? Or we can go on to the next presentation and have more questions at the end. Oh, I see. Uh, Arena, do you have a question? Sorry, I did have a question. Um, so um, one thing that uh, I sort of worried about in the aftermath of the recession was how this might interact with, um, you know, differential uh, access insurance and some of the other supports uh, that different households got. Um, is that something that you might be able to sort of match up the accumulation of wealth? Because there was a big increase in savings at, after um like the big cope um so i was just wondering if that was something that you'd be able to match up to to add to your yes uh, thanks irina uh, yeah so access savings is a important issue um during covid um how like due to various fiscal support people's income actually didn't decline on the other hand there are various um, pandemic restrictions that make people to consume less so the two forces together means that there are access savings. Is this important? Um, uh, it, does it contribute to the accumulation of wealth? Yes, of course, especially for people at the lower end of the wealth distribution. But is it a crucially important factor um, to, um, to change, say, the share of top 1% wealth? Uh, it is not. This is because um, the access savings um, is actually relatively small compared to the overall wealth. Well, let me give you an example. So up to the second quarter of 2021, the total access savings was about $2 trillion. But at that point, overall household wealth was about $120 trillion. So that is like less than 2% um, uh, 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 of the overall household wealth. So yes, we, we do think it contributes to wealth accumulation at the lower end, but in general, even if all of this um, contribute to the um, wealth accumulation in the lower end, it's not going to change the share uh, of top 1% wealth holds, um, households. It's just, it's too small compared to the overall wealth and which is very concentrated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if we have no more questions, we can go on to the next paper. Okay, so the next paper is on financial constraints and the racial housing gap. This is uh, presenting author is Arpit Gupta. Yeah, thanks so much. I'd like to thank uh, Natasha, Laura, and the other organizers for including our work on the program. Uh, this paper is joint with Chris Hansman, who's at Imperial, and Pierre Mabile, who's at INSEAD. So the motivation for our project is the large racial disparities that we observe in housing access. These disparities have motivated considerable policy and academic interest to understand the root causes. We focus on whether real estate amplifies the importance of racial wealth inequalities as a consequence of differences in initial wealth and leverage. So that's ex ante, not an obvious question. In many traditional models, groups who face low initial wealth can simply engage in additional savings to catch up in wealth levels. What makes real estate different from other assets, however, is that it's not just a financial instrument, but it's also a choice in location which determines income. So we approach this question through a combination of reduced form and structural methods. We begin with comprehensive longitudinal uh, housing choice data, which allows us to uh, yeah, kind of develop a framework to think about the intersection of racial groups and housing markets. And then we move to uh, structural analysis uh, that is going to kind of take uh, these reduced form facts. We emphasize the importance of what we refer to as the racial leverage gap. 
minority borrowers have substantially higher LTV ratios than white borrowers, reflecting the role of higher wealth requests for white borrowers to make down payments. This financial constraint means that minority borrowers disproportionately access housing through the FHA mortgage program. This federal mortgage channel enables minority borrowers access to high leverage mortgages, but limits the locations they can access through a loan cap. The consequence is that minority borrowers are rationed in their, in their ability to access areas with high loan sizes, which tend to offer better amenities, including job access and higher income. Financial constraints may therefore have persistent impacts on future wealth accumulation by limiting access to these high opportunity regions. So we connect these reduced form facts to our structural model and find several results. Uh, first, house price shocks, which you can kind of loosely think of as a uh, gentrification shock, have very, little, have very different consequences for white and black borrowers. While white borrowers' wealth has improved in the aftermath of price shocks, it has non-monotonic consequences on black wealth, consistent with the idea that minority borrowers may be uniquely at risk of displacement due to their financial constraints. We also look at reparation-style policies, uh, which do improve black wealth for a subset of the distribution. However, many policies we look at face the issue that black borrowers are strongly constrained by leverage, and hence there's a trade-off between increasing wealth and increasing home ownership. So the key takeaway from the paper is that real estate does serve to amplify wealth inequalities, which has consequences on the racial wealth gap. However, policy is intended to address this face important trade-offs exactly as a consequence of that high financial friction and leverage that black borrowers are using to access housing. Home ownership is not a perfect answer to the problem of addressing racial wealth gaps as a consequence. So we connect a large number of traditional real estate data sets uh, for the purpose of our project. Most of these are pretty standard. The one I want to highlight in particular is the Infutura data set, which tracks individual housing choice across both renting and ownership or across the life cycle, uh, across different rental spells and mortgage choices. This enables us to get a better sense of the life cycle of housing choice for both minority and white borrowers. Okay, we're going to start by highlighting uh, first key descriptive fact. Minority borrowers and black borrowers in particular are much more likely to have high leverage. Across the LTV distribution here on the x-axis, we plot a histogram and we see borrowers clustering at two points in the distribution, those who are putting 20% down or have 80% LTV, and those who are actually putting very little down in their mortgages. Black and Hispanic borrowers are much more likely to have very minimal down payment on their mortgages, which means that they enter home ownership with very little equity. This fact means that the racial composition of borrowers is actually very different across levels of LTV. High down payment mortgages are disproportionately used by white and also Asian borrowers, while well, Black and Hispanic borrowers account for basically half of all high leverage mortgage contracts. We don't actually find large racial differences in PTI by contrast, and so we're going to focus throughout on LTV as our main measure of financial constraints across racial groups. So these high LTV contracts are generally accommodated by the federal FHA mortgage system. This is a system of federally insured mortgages, which enables leverage as high as 96.5% LTV, and in fact, we see that many FHA borrowers in the top panel are clustering exactly at that very high LTV level, which is enabling a really minimal down payment. Non-FHA eligible borrowers, by contrast, are much more likely to have that more traditional 20% down. Level. Now, while the FHA provides an important ladder in housing access, a key limitation is that it comes with loan caps. These are similar in spirit to the more, more uh, typically studied conventional loan caps, which are a little bit higher in the distribution. I'm showing here in the blue line, bunching at the FHA national loan cap, uh, and there's also county level variation that we're going to use. A consequence of this FHA cap is that many borrowers, uh, many high leverage borrowers, uh, shown here in blue, can be basically found clustered just below that FHA cap amount. So why, why is all this an issue? Well, it turns out that many high opportunity areas offer relatively few mortgages accessible through the FHA system. In California, for instance, we see that there's relatively little housing accessible through FHA in the job rich coastal cities and much more FHA availability in the inland areas that have less opportunity. This holds up if we focus on the Bay Area in particular, we see that lower, F we see lower FHA availability in San Francisco in the South Bay where all the tech jobs are and more FHA eligible jobs in the East Bay which is a little bit more distant from job opportunities. This is reflective of a much more general issue, which is that areas that have higher loan amounts tend to have access to much better amenities including income shown here. So we also find differences in job access and school quality uh, in the paper. This makes housing very different from other assets. To the extent that financial constraints limit access to housing, that will have a persistent impact on future income because the locational attribute of real estate is tied with local labor markets. 
Okay, so the key takeaway from this reduced form analysis will be to support a two by two view of demographics and housing choice that we're gonna use in our structural model. We focus on the difference between white and black borrowers who face strong differences in down payments and leverage, which ultimately reflect large differences in bequests. White families are able to afford higher down payments due to interfamily transfers. These two groups can access housing through mortgages, uh, which enable access divided into an FHA eligible and a non FHA eligible housing stock. FHA eligible mortgages are accessible by high leverage mortgage contracts, but don't offer as strong access to opportunity as the housing stock inaccessible by some mortgages. Okay, so moving to the structural model, we're going to set up agents into uh, black and white demographic groups and model life, uh, life cycle asset and location choice. There are key differences in initial wealth between groups and bequests are redistributed within each group. Interest rates are, are basically set equal between the two groups. Uh, there's a large uh, contested literature examining the role of discrimination. Uh, the objective of our paper is to explore how important wealth persistence in housing might be even in a world absent formal discrimination. Also decide to move between one of two housing stocks, a low price housing stock accessible by high leverage FHA loans and a high price stock and they pay a moving cost between these. Then in each area, they decide their consumption choice and whether to rent or own. Renting enables partial access to housing services, while ownership enables access to better housing stock, consumption smoothing benefits, and the utility benefit of ownership, uh, which, we which is necessary to match ownership data. House purchases are subject to LTV and payment to income PTI caps, which vary by area according to FHA limits. Uh, alternatively, households can also purchase a risk-free asset. So uh, in our, we, we calibrate this model uh, and match a large uh, range of macroeconomic variables, uh, information on housing stock across FHA, non-FHA eligible areas, as well as across uh, racial demographics. Uh, we, we then uh, kind of calibrate other statistics in order to match the data, in particular racial differences in home ownership. Uh, some of these key moments that we target here include differences in income and home ownership across racial groups. Uh, though we do not explicitly target them, our model actually also does a good job at matching racial differences in wealth and leverage overall. So the central tension we're gonna highlight in the structural analysis is a trade-off between wealth and leverage. So policymakers have an objective to increase home ownership rates in order to address the racial uh, housing wealth gap. However, we find that the high leverage minority borrowers used to access housing is often gonna make such policies less desirable. Okay, so the, the first kind of key finding we're gonna kind of look at here is uh, from the structural analysis is the impact of, of wealth shocks. So these turn out to be very persistent, meaning that black borrowers who face shocks to their initial wealth are going to face long run increases in their subsequent wealth as well. This is actually not an obvious finding. Uh, the work in many models, including by Ben Mall, has found that borrowers will self save in order to overcome financial constraints. However, the housing context, giving black borrowers more wealth enables them to actually move to high opportunity areas, the area number one, uh, which gives them access to higher income. They're otherwise unable to borrow against the stream of future income in that area. And so the initial wealth is overcoming the spatial misallocation in which black borrowers are not matched to high opportunity areas. So we find that increasing the initial wealth of black borrowers does have a subsequent increase on future wealth and, and also therefore of income. So we next look at uh, price shocks, uh, which wind up having really interesting nonlinear effects. So first, all else equal, uh, an increase in price. Uh, here, we're looking at the increase in price in the non-FHA eligible housing stock. So that's like an increase in price in San Francisco. Um, that's going to decrease homeownership because it makes owning more expensive relative to renting. That's going to therefore lower home equity and housing wealth. However, because it also makes it harder to access homeownership, it also leads to selection among buyers who actually need higher wealth and income in order to access the same house. So we see that an increase in price in the high opportunity uh, zone area is leading to an increase in home ownership by black home households in the other housing stock area, as the endogenous reallocation of black borrowers to the relatively cheaper stock is leading to the spillover effects. So the increase, the impact of higher uh, house prices on, on leverage is sort of uh, linear and increasing for white households, but sort of U-shaped uh, for black borrowers. So higher house prices sort of unambiguously increase white households wealth, but have non-monotonic non non impacts on black households wealth and hence on the racial wealth cap, uh, which is inversely U-shaped. That's because higher house prices first increase the average wealth of black borrowers, their home equity is kind of improving uh, faster than the reduction in home ownership, 
And then it results in a decrease in black wealth as lower home ownership rates ultimately more than, more than uh, offset the improvement in leverage due to selection. So uh, high house prices and, and high opportunity areas also lower uh, black income and lead to displacement towards uh, the lower opportunity zone area, which affects adversely affects black borrowers even in the other area. So the intuition is that as San Francisco sees price raises, that's really ac limiting access to opportunities for black borrowers, even those who live in Phoenix. So uh, we also examine shifts to what happens if you increase prices in uh, the FHA eligible stock as well. That has kind of similar nonlinear uh, price dynamics that sort of differ between black and white borrowers. Uh, in particular, we see that white borrowers' wealth uh, really improves uh, with the increase in price, even in the home prices in Phoenix, uh, whereas black borrower wealth is, uh, is, is, uh, is going down as a consequence of increases in price shocks. We also look at, um, uh, we use our model to address other policy counterfactuals. So the ones here include reparation style policies, which we analyze to specifically target black households and seek to equate their initial conditions for asset purchase, income, and entry into high opportunity areas. So increasing wealth for black households uh, does not actually increase home ownership rates very much. Uh, instead, it's primarily decreasing leverage. By contrast, access to opportunity policies, the third one here, um, actually decrease home ownership and while they actually build much more, 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 more wealth. So that kind of illustrates a sort of trade-off between policies that kind of improve uh, home ownership versus those that actually improve, improve wealth. So we also look at other policies specifically targeting mortgage markets, uh, either removing the FHA entirely or generating an additional interest rate subsidy. Of course, borrowers are going to be worse off when the FHA program is reduced, and we find that home ownership rates do go down, uh, particularly in the FHA eligible area. However, we find that leverage actually strongly decreases and wealth actually rises as a consequence of limiting the FHA program. The underlying reason for that is that in order to gain access to housing absent the FHA mortgage program, Black borrowers who are already financially constrained have to make highly distortionary savings decisions away from their ideal consumption path in order to accumulate the wealth necessary for down payments. The interest rate subsidies work in the opposite direction, increasing uh, home ownership rates uh, while actually decreasing wealth as people move to high opportunity areas uh, while actually lowering wealth accumulation. Uh, finally, we look at housing market policies, which include place-based policies such as increasing income in FHA eligible areas or reducing moving frictions. Lowering moving frictions in particular addresses the spatial misallocation faced by Black borrowers in low opportunity zones, uh, but actually also lowers uh, home ownership rates, right? So another trade-off between a policy that lowers home ownership rates, but actually increases wealth when we look at increasing, uh, easing moving frictions. Okay, so, uh, so our, policy, our project has basically two broad takeaways. So first, housing is not the same as other assets. Because real estate comes with access to jobs and opportunities, uh, minority borrowers who are financially constrained and are subject to this minority uh, leverage gap face important challenges in accessing high quality housing stock. Real estate, therefore, plays an important role in the persistence of wealth and accumulation across racial groups. We find that some policies, particularly ones that involve direct transfers or reducing frictions, can be effective at addressing the spatial misallocation of black borrowers. However, these same financial frictions and high leverage that black borrowers face do place important hurdles and constraints in evaluating policies. Simply improving housing access for minority borrowers does not necessarily improve Black wealth exactly because minority borrowers typically use high amounts of leverage to gain access to housing, so the gain in equity can actually be small. Uh, by contrast, other policies look at you know, improve wealth, don't actually improve uh, home ownership rates. So the, the, take, the takeaway is that just looking at racial housing ownership differences is not always a good statistic to diagnose racial wealth differences. Thank you very much. Uh, Lin Lin, do you have a question? <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. So I was wondering about um, about the rate of return to wealth, as the first the presenter was suggesting that's very important. And how did you, what's your assumption about that? And then you, um, I think in one scenario, you mentioned like uh, their house ownership will decrease while the wealth will increase, um, but um, so, so for that, have you accounted for the potential increases in housing prices that could increase the wealth of the individuals? Yeah, so, so that, that's, that's a great question and something that we're hoping to address in some, uh, some um, additional work on this project. We're, we're, we, we wanna draw in particular from recent literature by um, I believe uh, Kermani and some other co-authors that finds that um, black and white homeowners are subject to similar trends in, in uh, house prices, except at the moment of foreclosure. Uh, 
So that's like another example of the leverage difference generating a difference for black and white homeowners because high leverage is going to put black homeowners at greater risk of foreclosure, uh, losing your home. And that's exactly the moment when return differences in housing tend to materialize uh, um, in, in, a, in a racial way across black and white homeowners. So, so that's one of the ways we're hoping to push on the project is adding more of a role for uh, housing return differences. Okay, and we have a question in the chat about why it is that San Francisco is used, where the percentage of Black people is less than 7%, uh, and Phoenix is less than 8%. Why not something like Chicago or maybe Houston, where it's more diverse, or Atlanta, where you have a lot of more Black people, but they're diverse by income? Uh, th th that's a fair point. I should probably use uh, San Francisco and Houston or San Francisco and Atlanta. Uh, I, I suppose the Phoenix also has a fairly Just large- Just to kind uh, of, yeah, double check things you know. and see how they vary. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, fair, yeah, fairly large uh, population. But San Francisco is, is a great example for us because the, the statistic you mentioned, the low minority share in San Francisco's population, we think is exactly related to these kinds of tensions going on, right? So the high rents, the high house prices have an impact on rationing and lowering the share of minority borrowers who live in the area and who are thereby able to access all the, the great tech jobs and opportunities that are available in the region. Okay, and Shell Chen, you have a question? Yes, um, I was wondering um, in terms of the response to house price shocks, if you could build the expectation channel. Because now if you have higher house price, right, it's like supply shock, everyone reduced their demand for housing. And, and then of course, ownership uh, falls and also housing stock falls. But if you could build an expectation channel, right, when you see house prices rising, you expect it to increase. That is going to build in a demand channel and that is consistent with data. Yeah, that, that's a good point. One, one thing we actually did in this project is uh, look at survey data on how black and white uh, homeowners uh, perceive housing differently. And, and one point of difference is that black, home, we haven't used this so far, but black homeowners actually have a perception of high risk in housing markets. Uh, so their kind of second moment expectation is different from, from white homeowners. And that might be another contributing factor to some of the patterns that we find here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next paper. Uh, this is presented by uh, Daniel Ringo on racist, racial bias and mortgage lending. Okay, so thanks for having me. I have to get the standards claim out of the way that the views and conclusions expressed here uh, do not reflect the, uh, the views or opinions of the, uh, the Federal Reserve. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about discrimination in mortgage markets. So we've known for a long time that uh, mortgage outcomes uh, have, have very large disparities by race. In particular, what we're going to be focusing on today is the disparities in the de denial rate. What I'm showing you here uh, is a plot of the uh, the fraction of all uh, mortgage applications and the 2018 and 2019 uh, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, which covers the uh, the vast majority of all loans or all loan applications in the U.S., um, showing you the denial rates uh, by race. And what you can see is that relative to non-Hispanic whites, uh, minority applicants, and in particular Black applicants, have vastly higher denial rates. Uh, the, the black white uh, denial disparity, the, the black uh, denial rate is almost double that of uh, non Hispanic whites. So, uh, what we're going to try to do is, in a, in a broad sense, um, split this, split the cause of these disparities into two factors uh, and uh, pin down to some degree the magnitude of how important each of the two uh, uh, factors is. And the first, the, the first idea is that these disparities could be coming up. Uh, as a result of sort of standard underwriting uh, uh, procedures applied neutrally across races, but because of differences in racial or ethnic, uh, racial or ethnic differences and um, these risk factors, you get the disparities we just uh, we just showed you. Um, the other possibility is that this could be discrimination, and the notion of discrimination we're considering in this paper is disparate treatment, which basically means uh, two similarly situated borrowers who differ only on the basis of their race or ethnicity. Uh, getting a different uh, credit decision. So this covers both uh, taste-based discrimination as well as, as well as any statistical discrimination. And we think it's important to uh, keep in mind that we, we want to look at both because uh, there's a lot of interest in things like uh, uh, Becker-type tests for, for looking at um, the profitability of, of marginal loans or the, the marginal minority versus marginal white borrower to see if uh, that's, you know, uh, the idea being that, that taste-based discrimination should show up as a, a higher profitability of the marginal minority loan. Um, 
Uh, but that kind of test is, is totally incapable of detecting statistical discrimination. Um, and we think that uh, both are illegal and both have sort of very negative consequences for uh, people sort of trust the financial system generally. So uh, we, we want to look at both. Um, the data we're, we're looking at is coming from, uh, as I mentioned, Humda. Uh, for decades, uh, Humda has covered uh, the most, uh, vast majority of the mortgage market uh, and has gotten given us um, uh, the demographic data, some limited application information, and uh, a uh, and then finally the, the lender's decision on each of those applications, whether to accept or reject it. Um, which it's been ham it's it's been our sort of our best source for looking at these uh, uh, denial disparities by race. Uh, but it's been hampered by a lack of good information on the underwriting criteria that lenders really use to look at the risk of each application. But starting in 2018. Uh, Humda collection was really expanded to include a very important underwriting criteria like credit score, loan to value ratio, uh, debt payment to income ratio. And importantly for what we're trying to do, uh, it also includes the outcome of underrated, uh, automated underwriting systems uh, that were used if, if the application was run through one. So uh, the majority of loans uh, currently go through one of these systems, which are produced uh, generally by, um, by one of the agencies that, or the quasi-governmental agencies. Uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, or the FHA uh, to give a, uh, an algorithmically generated uh, recommendation for whether the loan uh, should be approved uh, or whether it's ineligible to be uh, purchased by the, by the relevant agency. Um, these, these AUSs, although the, uh, the algorithm itself is not, has, is not publicized, uh, we know that they do not include uh, direct information on the borrower's race uh, nor some some proxies for it, like we don't. It, it can't look sort of neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, so what we're going to be able to do with this new data is uh, compare a, a race blind, uh, algorithm, algorithmically generated uh, credit recommendation to the actual credit decision by the lender on the same set of applications. So starting off, just looking at some of the summary statistics uh, from this 2018 to 2019 data, and we're looking at kind of bread and butter, 30 year fixed rate mortgages for owner occupied homes, the first lane, we're looking at purchases and refinances both. Um, we're limiting ourselves to loans that went through one of these three government AUSs. But as I mentioned, about 90% of applications go through this. So we haven't really limited our sample much by that restriction. Uh, and the top line on this chart is showing you uh, denial rates by lenders uh, across the different races, similar to that first, uh, similar to that first chart. Uh, but what you can see on the second line is the AUS denial rate. So we're coding uh, the AUS recommendations either you were uh, approved uh, in terms of credit risk and eligible for purchase, and everything else gets uh, is what we're calling an AUS denial. Uh, and what you can see is that the gaps by race, um, particularly between white and black applicants, uh, um, from the AUS recommendation. Are about as large as the gaps uh, from lenders overall. And looking further down, you can see you know, some potential reasons why the differences in incomes, the, the, the differences in credit scores, loan to value ratios, and, and, and debt to income ratios. Uh, so you know, altogether, the, the, the AUS is looking at all these things, it's producing their recommendations. And uh, in terms of magnitude, lender differences in lender recommendations look similar. So you know, maybe we're done. Maybe we've explained everything. Um, we haven't. So the first thing we try to do is uh, run individual loan level regressions for the out, with the outcome being whether or not the lender denied the applicant, um, including some, some uh, indicators for the race or ethnicity of the, of the applicant, which we're showing you in column one. So this is just showing you the, the, the raw denial rate gaps by race uh, relative, relative to white applicants, non-Hispanic white applicants. And in column two, we add as our, as our single covariate uh, the recommendation from, from the AUS, you know, whether, uh, whether the loan was recommended approved or not. Uh, and while this shrinks the gap, particularly for the, the black white gap goes from about nine to less than four and a half percentage points, it doesn't go to zero. Uh, and this is because lenders don't have to follow the AUS recommendation. They can either uh, approve the loan and hold it on portfolio if they can't sell it to the GSEs, for example, or more commonly they can impose overlays, which is uh, they can have a stricter standards on the on uh, uh, for underwriting requirements and then the the AUS uh, demands. So this could be something like a higher minimum FICO score. So to try to see if these uh, these overlays and observable risk factors are driving the gaps, we control very flexibly for all the information we have in Humda. So we have a very fine grid of credit scores, loan to value ratios, DTI uh, ratios. We interact everything, um, and what we're showing you here is the result in column three. 
So again, the, the gap shrank further, uh, looking particularly at the black-white gap, it's gone from nine down to two percentage points, but two percentage points is not zero. So we've, we, uh, after we controlled for everything available in Humda, we seem to have these, uh, what we're calling excess denials, these unexplained residual denial gaps of about one to two percentage points. So the question becomes, can we interpret these themselves as the magnitude of the level of discrimination? Uh, so there's also possibilities that lenders are looking at risk factors that we don't observe in Humda, but they can see. Uh, these could be things like uh, the, you know, the number of uh, months of cash reserves that the borrower has, uh, how long they've been with their current employer, uh, things like that. Um, fortunately for us, in some sense, uh, we know that the AUS systems uh, take some of these factors into account. So when we rerun our, uh, our estimator, but instead of using the lender denial as the outcome variable, we use with the AUS denial is the outcome variable. Uh, we see in, in column one with no controls, we see those AUS denial gaps that you, you could, um, you could uh, in, uh, infer from our first table. And in column two, when we control for everything, you can see that at least uh, uh, between black and white applicants, there still is an unexplained uh, difference in the rate at which the algorithm uh, recommends approval for, for white applicants at a, a higher rate than black applicants, about one and a half percentage points. So this suggests that there are some unobserved risk factors observable to the lender in the AUS system um, that suggest that the black applicants are still riskier. Uh, and to see that it, this may be affecting lenders' decisions, uh, we kind of plot everything out uh, across uh, credit scores, dividing our sample up into to find credit score groups and plot the excess denials. What this is showing you is that uh, even controlling for all these factors, it is the lower credit score applicants that we see the largest black white, the un largest unexplained black white gaps in. Um, that's that's what you can see in this declining uh, line here. Where we're plotting excess denials by uh, FICO score bucket against the FICO score itself. And then we see the same pattern uh, among the, the AUS excess denials, the unexplained uh, AUS black white denial gap. That again, it's, it's among the lower score borrowers uh, that the black white difference in uh, the AUS recommendation is largest. So this is suggestive that, again, there are these unobservable risk factors that differ by race um, that may be driving some of the, uh, of the lender denial disparities by races. Of course, we actually, you know, we're controlling for the AUS outcome in our main regression. So why isn't that enough to absorb these unobserved factors? And the answer, or a potential answer, is that uh, this may be due to uh, overlays on these unobservable factors. So perhaps the AUS wants to see four months of reserves, but a particular lender wants to see six months. Um, similarly, they, they could even uh, be imposing standards on factors the AUS doesn't consider at all, like some lenders may have very strict uh, requirements for the verification of income, for example, or require a large amount of documentation. If there are racial disparities in the ability to produce that documentation or, or they would say you're having that, that's the six months of reserves, um, this could be driving some of the excess denial gaps. So to try and look for evidence supporting or, or, um, or, or uh, rejecting that story, uh, we take advantage of the fact that lenders do not all have identical uh, underwriting criteria, that some lenders are going to be very strict in their overlays and some lenders are going to be very uh, much more generous. So the idea would be that uh, if excess denials are being driven by uh, lender overlays and some of these unobservable factors, then it's the strictest lenders that ought to be uh, the strictest in the sense of um, they have the, the standards that uh, uh, appear to be sort of that uh, uh, have, they have the largest unexplained denial rates. Um, those lenders should be the ones that uh, are, are showing us the highest level of excess denials. And so when we measure our strictness as the unexplained denial rate of white applicants uh, for each lender. So we, do, we take the 100 largest, the, the largest lenders in our sample and individually for each of them measure a strictness. So how likely are they to, uh, to have an unexplained denial of a white applicant and correlate that with the individual lender excess denial. So how much more likely is a, uh, a minority applicant than an otherwise similar looking uh, white applicant to be denied by this lender? Um, we see a very tight positive correlation. So we're showing this here for black applicants, but we have a very similar, uh, we can produce a very similar graph for, for Asian, Asian and Hispanic applicants relative to white, that the excess denials uh, at, a, at an individual lender level are quite highly correlated with how strict that lenders appear to uh, be on white applicants, which is suggested to us, or at least it fits a story of um, uh, lenders who have these stricter overlays on unobservables 
uh, are also are, are creating these, uh, these higher excess denials, at least partially through um, you know, the minority applicants being more likely to be caught by, uh, by some of these filters on, uh, on, on observable factors. So everything we've been doing so far has been kind of looking at, uh, is there evidence for the existence of these differences in unobservable factors by race and, and do lenders, are lenders basing their uh, underwriting decisions on that? A different way of approaching the problem would be to try to look a little more directly for evidence of discrimination itself. And the way we do that is to uh, uh, consider, consider situations in which uh, ex ante, we might consider uh, discrimination to be more likely and look if we see excess denials uh, stronger in those situations. So the first thing we look at is uh, competitive, competitiveness of the market. Uh, in markets that are more concentrated and lenders have more market power, uh, we've, the lack of sort of market discipline could allow them to engage in inefficient taste-based discrimination. So we run those same regressions interacting um, with, for lender denials, interacting applicant race with the, uh, uh, the top four, the, 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 sh the market share of the top four lenders. Uh, and we find uh, no evidence for the story that the coefficients are all slightly negative, uh, suggesting that excess denials are not larger in less competitive situations. Um, the next thing we look at is uh, trying to measure racial animus directly. So here we, we uh, borrow the, the measure from Stevens Davidowitz uh, of the frequency of racially charged Google search terms and see if uh, excess denials are higher in areas that have uh, um, uh, high levels of this measured racial animus. And they actually do. So you can see this in the, in the first column, you can see these small positive uh, coefficients. Uh, however, when we run the same uh, regressions with the outcome variable being the AUS denial, which again, uh, does not directly, the AUS does not directly observe the uh, race of the applicant, we similarly see uh, positive uh, uh, interaction terms about the same magnitude. So this means that in those markets that have these higher uh, levels of measured racial animus, you also see higher uh, black minority, sorry, higher ga uh, gaps between white and minority applicants in their unobserved risk factors, which you know, we can't control for, but you know, the AUS measures and uh, uh, is reacting to. So uh, this test is in some sense inconclusive because we do see higher excess denials, but they may be explained by these unobserved factors. Um, and then finally, we look at uh, fintechs relative to traditional lenders, the IB, DIB and the fintechs, which do most of sort of the, the application processing automatically with much less face-to-face -face interaction might be expected to have uh, lower levels of racial discrimination. Um, and we're showing you here just for FHA purchase loans, but the, the same holds true in sort of all the cuts of the data we've looked at. Uh, this doesn't seem to be the case. If anything, the coefficient on FinTech, uh, or the, 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 among FinTechs, the, um, uh, the minority white gaps are, are slightly larger than among traditional lenders. So we don't think, so this doesn't really fit with the story of, of FinTechs, of, Excess now is being due to discrimination, and then fintechs being able to cure that by sort of taking humans out of the loop. Um, so I think I'm at time, so I'll just jump to the conclusion where uh, you know, we, these, these higher denial rates between minority and, and white applicants are mostly explained by a combination of AUS recommendation uh, and lender imposed overlays on observable underwriting factors, observable in HUMDA, kind of the main three DTI, FICO, LTB. Um, and these one to two remaining percentage point uh, excess denials may they, uh, they may reflect some discrimination, but there's we're showing a lot of the evidence suggesting that at least partially uh, they're due to unobservable characteristics, unobservable to us and humble characteristics that differ by race, um, and that lenders in the AUS uh, uh, to take into account. And so I think the main takeaway here is that addressing uh, racial disparities in, in access to mortgage credit is really uh, more of a problem of uh, doing something about equilibrating uh, uh, or close, closing gaps in, in credit scores between races or trying to understand whether the, um, the standards that are, are being imposed on the credit on the mortgage market are in fact uh, appropriate, do, do sort of save investors, the public, whoever, um, enough in terms of, of re reduced denials to, um, to make up for the, the disparate um, impact that they, they have on, the, on different populations. Uh, so I'm, I think I'm way over. So uh, thanks very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any questions on this? All right, Jeff. Uh, the final process, uh, apparently minorities don't do as well. Uh, is the sort of analysis on that biased in some way? 
or is it because on average, maybe they're not as used to filling out, on average, filling out forms and so on. For example, my wife, who's a PhD, is having incredible difficulty figuring out how to do some insurance for our son. So, and would one policy be to help in filling out these forms and applications? Yeah, thanks. So you're, you're kind of referring to a result I don't really have time to, to get to. That's, yeah, that's um, my, I, I love that result. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 15 minutes and I think I went over anyway. Um, so yeah, so we did find that at least in terms of the explanation that lenders give, because they're required to give an explanation for each denial, that uh, verification and, and uh, application completeness uh, were, were a, a really decent chunk of the overall excess denial gaps, which yeah could explain that you know maybe you could uh, close the gaps by helping out uh, or providing better service and you know getting people through those final stages. Um, that's in, in some sense that's the rosiest interpretation. Another interpretation is that uh, there are actual racial disparities in the level of service that's being provided. So it's it, it may not be totally innocuous that that it's uh, it, you know it's it's not clear which side of the table is causing the uh, uh, the greater difficulty in, in uh, finishing the application process. But um, at least according to, to lender self report, yes, uh, if if you could get everybody through, that would just just the application process, not the underwriting, um, that would tend to have a meaningful uh, shrinking of, of the, of the uh, overall access denial gap. Okay, and we have another question by Shell Chen. Yeah, so do you see any difference between refi and home purchases? I would imagine for refi, maybe the differential is smaller. Uh, we look at them both. I, I think the, re the refi difference is actually slightly larger. Uh, it's, yeah. it basically, it's, there's a lot of robustness checks in the appendix, kind of any cut of the data, it's there. The excess denial gap is there. Okay, Lin-Lin. Okay, um, yeah, great presentation. Um, I was wondering like if people have different um, information or trust among the local lenders, like maybe the black, uh, bl uh, black people would prefer black lenders more so that maybe refers to, uh, relates back to your access story and that explaining the disparities. There's, so there's one very important caveat to everything we're showing, which is that our study starts with the official, once the official application process has started. So the whole process by which someone, you know, decides to seek out mortgage credit, uh, the early stages of them talking to a loan officer and the, you know, the pre-approval or pre-qualification process, uh, we don't have any data on that, we don't model that. So if there are, you know, disparities either in how loan officers treat, uh, you know, prospective applicants by race before they actually get the application, or if um, uh, applicants themselves sort of sort uh, into who they're approaching, there could be some differences there. That said, we do, um, when we do control for lender fixed effects, at least we don't have individual loan officer uh, fixed effects, but when we control for uh, lender fixed effects, uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. So it doesn't look like there's a very strong tendency or say black applicants to sort into lenders with higher denial rates or anything like that. Okay. And um, I just have a comment on your description of the automated um, mortgage thing being race blind. I think that your results will obviously stand if you don't call it race blind, but I'm not sure that you, sh you should go so far to say it's race blind. I don't know that you can tell that. And I mean, I don't understand how it is that uh, in, with mortgages, which are attached to a house, which is attached to a certain zip code areas wouldn't come into play or even where you once lived if you happen to put your current address on there, how that kind of stuff wouldn't come into play in an algorithm, not knowing the algorithm. Right, so it, it, would, it would be nice if I could have like, you know, given you the actual formula. Uh, yeah. They, so it's, it's, I, it's, yeah, it's, I know you can't, but it, you don't need to respond, we're out of time. But uh, yeah, your, your results will be the same, but I don't think you have to call it race blind since you don't know that, but the results, they won't change much, right? So, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm sorry, but we are out of time on yours. So um, let's move on to, um, Sabrina Howell on racial disparities in small business credit. Well, thanks very much for including our paper on the program.
So this paper is uh, now called Automation Can Mitigate Racial Disparities in Small Business Lending, Evidence from the Paycheck Protection Program. So it's a, a little bit different from what you see uh, on, the, on the program. It's joint with Teresa Kuchler and David Snickhoff, who I think are both here, as well as Johannes Strobel and Jun Wang. So our motivation is uh, the presence of longstanding concerns about racial disparities in lending outcomes, both in the US and elsewhere. And there's been a debate about whether fintech lenders amplify or reduce these disparities, um, as Dan was just discussing. On one hand, and you know, this really you know, relates closely to that previous presentation, it's possible that complex algorithms could lead to more statistical discrimination. Alternatively, automation might mitigate disparities. Uh, we could imagine that lower fixed costs enable um, you know, an automated lender to serve smaller businesses. Being online might allow it to serve a broader array of locations. And finally, by eliminating human decision-making, um, it could reduce discrimination. So the Paycheck Protection Program, which was $806 billion in small business loans during the COVID-19 pandemic, is an especially useful setting for studying automation in particular, so sort of isolating that element. And the reason is that in contrast to other settings like you know, mortgages, here lenders faced no credit risk, but still got to decide who to serve. So in this context with no credit risk, we will ask two questions. First, are there systematic racial differences in PPP loans by lender type? And second, what is the role of automation in explaining these differences? The Paycheck Protection Program consisted of almost 12 million loans in 2020 and 2021. We're gonna focus on loans before the end of February, 2021, when there were major changes to the program. The key features of these loans that, that we want you to know about are that the amount was entirely determined by payroll. The loan was fully forgiven if used for qualified expenses and the majority of loans have already been forgiven. And the loans were processed and administered by private lenders who were compensated based on the loan amount. The loans were not collateralized and were 100% government guaranteed. There was minimal risk, risk for lenders, even in the case of borrower default or fraud. So we're gonna focus on um, a number of different data sets. The primary one is from the SBA on their PPP loans. We'll use 5.7 million unique first loans. And in these data, we can see the lender identity, the loan amount, the borrower identity, as well as the borrower's industry and organizational form. We predict the race and ethnicity of the borrower using the business owner name. We get names from state business registrations where the borrower isn't just a name in the PPP data. Now, the first thing I wanna say is that if you, you know, have a problem with using an algorithm to predict race, um, we, our results are entirely robust to using a subsample of 1 million self-identified borrowers. However, the second thing I wanna say is that we actually think the signal is more interesting. The loan officers in our context are primarily observing applicant name and location, which are key inputs into our model and actually not usually self-identified race. Um, so we actually think this signal is especially interesting in this context. We also use bank statement data from Oculus, credit and debit card revenue from Enigma and PPP applications to the Lendio platform. So first, let's look at some raw kind of descriptive statistics. We see that fintechs made a disproportionate share of their PPP loans to Black-owned businesses. Specifically, they made 26% of their PPP loans to Black-owned businesses, much more than any other lender type. Conditional on being a Black-owned business, the disparity is considerably more striking. Of Black-owned PPP borrowers, 54% of them got their PPP from a fintech, even though fintechs made only about 17% of all PPP loans. 
these disparities are much more striking than what we see for other groups. There are differences for the other racial and ethnic groups we look at, but they are they are not, you know just not as um, you know not as large. So this becomes the focus of our paper. We then try to explain that disparity with some basic observables that are you know tied to some of the economics of 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 fintech lending in particular. Um, so we include 100 percentiles for 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 uh, fixed effects of the loan amount, but it also works with a thousand you know a thousand um, uh, fixed effects. We include zip code fixed effects, uh, the week of loan approval fixed effects, industry fixed effects, business type fixed effects, fixed effects, and whether the um, firm is an employer or not. And with all of these controls, what you see in, in the first column is that black owned firms remain 12 percentage points more likely to get their loan from a FinTech um, relative to other groups, which is very large. It's still 70% of the mean chance of a FinTech loan. But, but the large difference from the raw disparity that I just showed you in the graphs of 39 percentage points, um, is interesting and it reflects the fintech capacity to make smaller loans. So, you know, the result goes down when we include these loan amount fixed effects and to serve different geographies. So we think this is an important mechanism through which fintechs are reducing racial disparities in practice. We don't see much of a relationship at all when it comes to getting your PPP from a top four bank. We see a, a negative coefficient when we look at large banks. And we see that most of this sort of quote unquote substitution towards fintech can be explained actually by substitution away from small and medium sized banks. So black owned firms are much less likely to get their PPP from a small and medium sized bank. So the next analysis I want to show you is the effect of automation. So when we think about what fintechs and top four banks have in common that they don't share with smaller banks, one answer is substantial automation in loan processing and approval. We exploit the fact that during PPP, to cope with application volume, some small banks automated through collaborations with white label fintech SaaS providers. This sort of changed the back end of the loan process, but not the front end that borrowers were seeing when they applied to their bank or a bank. We identify 20 automating small banks and then we ask whether lending to black owned business, businesses increased after automation relative to other non-automating small banks. So these graphs show that automation, which is uh, denoted by the month in the, with the red line, um, led to substantially higher loans to black owned businesses at these smaller banks. These are regression coefficients um, from a model that includes bank and time fixed effects. And we, we see a similar result at the weekly level. Um, looking, you know, just after versus before, rather than in the event study model, you know, we see automation increasing lending to black owned businesses, both with and without our, um, you know, rich array of fixed effects. And this higher lending to black owned businesses, you can see is coming primarily from less lending to white owned businesses in column five. So, Coming back to my sort of original, you know, original hypotheses, we think automation can help mitigate disparities um, by lower fixed costs and allowing them to serve smaller businesses, which we see because our effects decline with controls for loan size. Um, by the ability to serve a broader array of locations, we again see effects declining controls for location. The final reason is um, the elimination of the role of human decision makers, which would re reduce in particular preference-based discrimination from playing any, you know, any kind of a role. So now we'll look for some direct evidence for reduced discrimination. We interact um, being black owned with six measures of anti-black sentiment. For example, one of them is the county level implicit bias, bias uh, measures from the Harvard Implicit Association test. We see that being black owned increases the probability of getting your PPP from a FinTech in, that is growing in areas with higher anti-black racial animus. So this effect increases with the local anti-black racial animus. And that is true across all six of our measures, um, which have different geographies. Some are at the congressional district level. Some of them are at the um, at, a, at, at more of a metro area level, and we really see it across all of them. 
And as just one example, using the IAT, one standard deviation increase in racial animus um, is associated with a 7.5% higher chance of a peep of getting the PPP from a fintech for black owned firms relative to other borrowers. We also see um, that the, the sort of same result in reverse for non top four banks. So black owned businesses are less likely to get their PPP from a non top four bank in areas with higher anti black racial animus. And then related to this focusing again on small banks the effect of automation, that sort of causal effect of automation that I showed you in the event study is larger in areas with higher racial animus. We think that's a pretty cool result. Um, finally, we see no relationship um, for the probability of getting a PPP from top four banks. So applications are an important part of what's going on here that we can't see in the baseline SBA data. So all the all the um, analysis I've shown you so far is conditional on actually getting a PPP loan. But perhaps black owned businesses are more likely to apply to fintech lenders, perhaps because um, they just like fintechs more or they trust the traditional banking system less. And to explore whether this may be driving our results, we obtained data on PPP loan applications from Lendio, which is a marketplace platform that refers applications to partner lenders. We see which lenders the application was sent to. The referrals were based on preset criteria, in, particularly, in particular loan size, geography, and quotas, and were random conditional on those criteria. We then assume that the application was rejected if the business applied via Lendio. Lendio sent the application to at least one lender, but the business never got a PPP loan. And what we see, and I think this is an important real effect uh, in, that we're able to, to tease out um, in, our, in, our, in our data, um, is that Black-owned firms are less likely to get any PPP at all if they're sent by Lendio to a, con a conventional lender. And so this is, you can see here in column two, this is the subsample of our Lendio data um, in which Lendio sent that application only to a conventional bank. And the black owned firms are four percentage points more likely to get no PPP loan at all, ultimately. When we look at the sample sent only to FinTechs, um, there's no relationship you know, at all consistent with sort of not having any any higher rates of rejection of black owned businesses here relative to other groups. Um, and then in the final column, we see that that, that this same result is, 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 is appearing in an interaction model using the whole sample. So in sum, lower application rates don't explain the lower rates of you know, getting a conventional PPP for black owned firms. So in the final section, I want to provide, you know, a some, some sort of analysis on a number of other possible explanations. And perhaps the most important one um, is the role of bank and credit relationships. This has been a major you know, hypothesis in particular the media has put forward for why there may be racial disparities in PPP lending. So it's possible that banks prioritize existing clients um, and you know, maybe the black owned businesses were working with banks who weren't engaged in PPP lending or you know, just sort of weren't banked at all or something like that. We could imagine that for the, for the bank, it's easier administratively to serve your own clients. You already have their data. There also might be more continuation value. So we use business checking account bank statement data via Ocralis. What we find is that consistent with sort of this intuition, we do see preferential lending to the bank's own checking account customers. However, the racial disparity that I've been showing you is completely orthogonal to this preference for clients. And instead, that disparity at the non-top four banks, which is really, which, again, driving that substitution towards FinTech, a substitution away from, from non-top four banks, that's driven by new clients, by both, by both you know, white and black borrowers who are coming to the non-top four banks as, their, as, as new clients. We also show that credit relationships um, based on transactions in the bank statements, uh, which includes both regular loans and credit cards, don't explain the racial disparities. A second possible story um, has to do with real-time performance. So perhaps Black-owned firms experience a worst COVID-19 revenue shock. Now, this should have no effect on the profitability of a PPP loan, but it might affect the attractiveness of future interactions with the firm.
However, we show that the disparities are not explained by cash flows in the bank statement data or by real-time credit and debit card revenue, which we can see in the loan approval month, um, which was provided by Enigma for 1 million PPP borrowers. So even though the Black-owned businesses are much smaller and have much smaller revenue, that doesn't explain the disparities across, across lenders. The final story that I want to, to discuss is differential fraud rates. So maybe the Black-owned businesses were more likely to be committing fraud, and the smaller banks in particular were more concerned or aware of this. We think ex ante that this is pretty unlikely. First, as I mentioned earlier, the CARES Act, which created the PPP, effectively indemnifies the lender against liability for borrower fraud if the lender was unaware. Second, we wouldn't expect this channel to be driven by small banks since the top banks are the most tightly regulated and have the most advanced compliance systems. To push on this, we use a sample of unsealed DOJ PPP uh, enforcement cases. We can match 268 of these fraud cases by name to our sample. And what we find is that consistent with some existing work on this, in particular a paper by uh, John Griffin and Sam Kruger and co-authors, FinTechs were disproportionately responsible for fraudulent loans. They're responsible for up 46% of them. However, Black-owned firms only represent 8.4% of the fraud case, cases, which is in line with their share of our analysis population, 8.6%. So we don't think that differential fraud can really explain what we're seeing. So in sum, we, we find that automation reduces racial disparities in uh, small business lending during the PPP, and therefore likely in other contexts. There are actually reasons to think this should be sort of a lower bound for what we might see in, more, in, in, in lending where the lender does have uh, credit risk. We show that Black-owned firms are much more likely to get their loan from a FinTech and much less likely to get their loan from a non-top four bank. And when a Black-owned firm application is sent to a conventional lender, that firm has a much higher chance of no uh, PPP loan at all. We sh I showed you that after small banks automate, there's an increase in lending to Black-owned businesses. And both of these disparities are magnified in areas with more racial animus. We also showed that the disparities can't be fully explained by pre-existing banking or credit relationships, cash flow and revenue, or differential fraud. Um, and in sum, although we can't pin down preference-based discrimination the way one could in perhaps an audit, an audit study, the results in this large, important real-world context suggest some degree of racial discrimination. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions or comments? Okay. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next paper. Um, and if you come up with other questions, maybe we can ask those after that paper too. Okay. So the next paper is being presented by Sergey Chernyanko on racial disparities and the paycheck protection program. Ah, yes, thank you. So thank you, Laura, for um, including our paper in this uh, session. And thank you, Natasha, for chairing the session. Uh, this is joint work with uh, David Sharfstein. Uh, so we have two main goals in the paper, really. The first one is to uh, document and quantify racial disparities in access uh, to the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and the second one is to study and kind of like try to quantify the sources of these racial disparities in access to uh, PPP. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be thinking about um, um, differences in um, firm location, in uh, firm characteristics, in uh, borrowing relationships, and in, in, in potential effect of um, racial bias. Okay. Now, there are uh, two main challenges in studying access to the PPP. Uh, the first one is uh, data, right? Uh, the, the data that's generally available is on the loans that have been made, right? And we generally have little data on the population of uh, eligible firms. And even if we can construct some approximation of the population of eligible firms, 
uh, because these are small privately held firms, we rarely know uh, the racial and Hispanic identity of their firm owners uh, or the characteristics of these firms. Okay. Uh, the second challenge is in terms of interpretation, uh, thinking whether disparities in these outcomes are driven by loan supply, so some decisions made by lenders or by loan demand uh, from firms. Um, and, and another challenge in interpretation is whether disparities are driven by differential application rates or um, approval rates. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you that the disparities that we document are not driven by differences in loan demand, uh, but we're going to have a little bit less to say on the second interpretation challenge of whether it's like really differences in application rates uh, versus approval rates. Okay. Uh, so how are we going to tackle the data challenge that generally what we see is only approved loans uh, uh, and we don't necessarily see the population of borrowers. Um, so we're gonna, we think that we identified a pretty neat setting in which to study access to PPP, and that is we're going to study take up of PPP loans uh, by Florida restaurants. Uh, so these restaurants are generally small businesses, pretty much all of them were eligible for PPP. Uh, and in Florida, we have state level kind of restaurant license data that gives us the whole population of restaurants in Florida. Okay. Uh, we're also going to get a uh, location of the business and identity of the owner from corporate records. Um, and then we're going to match uh, this identity of the owner and corporate records to Florida voter registration data, uh, which Florida is one of the few states where voter registration includes uh, self-identified uh, racial and Hispanic identity. So based on this uh, voter registration data will be able to say whether the owner of the firm uh, of each potential borrower in our uh, in our uh, data uh, is black or Hispanic or Asian. Okay. Uh, we're also going to get restaurant characteristics, a fairly extensive set of kind of firm level controls uh, from Yelp and from restaurant license data. Um, we're going to measure borrowing relationships from UCC lien filings, which secured creditors file in order to establish essentially a priority claim on the collateral promise to them. Uh, and we're going to use, um, uh, similar to Sabrina's paper, we're going to use racial bias measure from Project Implicit, which is an online test that you can take measuring uh, implicit associations. Uh, and it also asks questions about explicit bias. So we're going to uh, use measures of both explicit and uh, implicit bias and get similar results uh, uh, both ways. Okay. Uh, and basically, our approach is going to be to estimate regressions of whether a given firm in our data received uh, a PPP loan as a function of whether it's owned by uh, a minority owner and firm characteristics, including potentially zip code fixed effects. So we're potentially going to be comparing uh, two firms in the same zip code with similar characteristics and asking whether, um, say, a minority-owned firm is less likely to receive uh, PPP at all, uh, and then if it does receive, whether it is more likely to is less likely to receive it from a bank compared to a non-bank. Um, we're also going to look at access to uh, another emergency relief program called IDL, Emergency um, Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Uh, so this this is an existing program run by SBA. Um, to help firms access credit when they're held with a, when they're negatively affected by uh, a disaster. Okay. Um, okay. Um, this is this outlines our the construction of our sample. The main thing really that I want to point here um, is that um, we do lose a, a, a fair bit of observations when we match to voter registration uh, data. Uh, but when we look at the characteristics of uh, firms that we can match, so that are in our final sample that we can match to voter registration versus characteristics of firms um, before the match to voter registration, they look fairly similar. Uh, so we're not, this, this gives us comfort that our results are unlikely to be, um, you know, meeting uh, biased in a, in a significant way by the fact that we're limiting our analysis to uh, restaurants uh, that can be more matched to voter registration data. Okay. Uh, let me skip the summary statistics and go to the results. Uh, so here we're estimating 
uh, linear probability model regressions um, of whether a firm, a restaurant in our data got a PPP loan. Uh, and in the column one, we're just including minority dummies. Uh, we also include female and other, uh, but I'm not showing those here uh, for uh, brevity. And in the first column, you can see that uh, black owned restaurants are 25 percentage points less likely uh, to get PPP loans than white owned restaurants. Hispanic restaurants are nine percentage points less likely to get PPP loans. Okay. Uh, in column two, we include a zip code level uh, control such as bank branches per capita, COVID cases per capita, uh, median household income and population. And the coefficient on uh, the black own, owner dummy declines by about four percentage points. Okay. Um, in column three, we uh, replace the zip code controls with zip code fixed effects and the coefficient on uh, the black owner declines further by about another percentage point. Okay. Uh, but overall, uh, it looks like location fixed effects explain about five percentage points of the gap uh, or about like 20% of the overall um, uh, of the underlying disparity. Uh, and most of these uh, location effects are due to bank branches per capita, uh, COVID cases per capita, household income and population. Okay. And then in column four, we include uh, an extensive list of controls that we get from restaurant license data and from Yelp. Uh, including firm size in terms of like number of seats, firm age, uh, whether it accepts credit cards, the number of reviews, average review, uh, the number of photos, uh, you know, the, the number of people who visit their Yelp profile, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and the coefficient on black here declines by um, 10 percentage points. Uh, so these differences in firm characteristics matter for access to PPP. Uh, but even when we control for this extensive list of uh, farm characteristics, we still get a large disparity in access to PPP of about 10 percentage points for uh, black owned restaurants. Okay. Uh, columns five through six look at uh, getting a bank PPP loan as the outcome and show that our results are essentially driven by um, less access to bank PPP loans. Uh, so black owned restaurants are almost 17 percentage points less likely to get a bank PPP loan uh, compared to similar, observably similar white owned restaurants in the same zip code. Um, in the next table, we look at essentially substitution to non-bank PPP loans and to idle loans. Uh, so the first four columns focus on uh, non-bank uh, non PPP lenders. Uh, and here we see that uh, black and Asian owned restaurants um, are more likely to get non-bank PPP loans, um, whether unconditional or controlling for their characteristics. Um, we don't see any substitution interestingly for Hispanic owned uh, firms. Okay. Um, uh, as you, uh, the other thing to note here is that for Asian firms, uh, there's essentially perfect substitution. So um, the, the, their higher propensity to get non-bank PPP loans uh, makes up for their lower propensity to get uh, bank PPP loans. Uh, but for black owned restaurants, this uh, substitution to non-bank PPP lenders is not enough to uh, make up for their 17 percentage points less likely to get uh, bank PPP loans. Okay. Uh, and then columns five through eight look at uh, the probability that the business received an idle loan. Uh, these loans are in many ways less attractive than PPP loans, primarily because they're not forgivable um, and oftentimes require collateral. Uh, so what we see here is that Black and Hispanic owned businesses uh, are significantly more likely to receive these uh, less uh, attractive idle loans compared to PPP loans. Okay. Uh, we next look at the role of uh, borrowing relationships and we measure borrowing relationships uh, by looking at uh, the UCC filings and seeing whether a firm has an outstanding secured uh, loan with either a bank or a non-bank financial institution. And what we see here is that uh, having an, uh, an existing UCC loan matters for access to PPP. So uh, firms with existing UCC loans are about five percentage points more likely to get uh, a PPP loan. Okay? Uh, but 
this doesn't affect our estimates of the coefficient on uh, the black owned uh, restaurants. Now, one reason why this might be the case is that uh, you, you might imagine that uh, you, uh, uh, black owned firms might have relationships with banks that were less active in the PPP program. Uh, so to control for that, we're gonna include a measure of uh, UCC banks PPP intensity, which is the number of PPP loans that the bank gave uh, compared to the number of UCC loans that it had. Uh, and we also, um, the other possibility is that uh, black owned firms might have weaker relationships with their banks uh, or be less satisfied with their relationships. Uh, so control, to control for that, we're gonna include an interaction between uh, black and having a bank UCC loan. And what we find here is a, a large negative interaction between uh, the black owner dummy and the ba uh, bank UC uh, having a bank UCC loan. And this is saying that having a bank UCC loan essentially uh, seems to help white owned businesses to get a PPP loan. Uh, but it doesn't help uh, black owned businesses. Uh, we next look at uh, the role of racial bias. And said, we're gonna be using um, measures of racial bias from project implicit, calculating uh, county level averages across white respondents and standardizing these averages so that the coefficients that I'm gonna be showing you on the next slide are gonna represent the effect of a one standard deviation increase in uh, racial bias. Uh, this is what uh, it looks like. Um, so um, in a, uh, focusing first on the bank PPP loan regressions, what we see is that the interaction between uh, black and racial bias is uh, negative and statistically significant. And what it is saying is that in a county that is one standard deviation higher in terms of racial uh, bias, uh, black owned businesses are 14 to 15 percentage points less likely uh, to get a PPP loan. Right? Uh, and this is on top of the existing uh, uh, um, differential. Okay? Um, turning to the non-bank PPP regressions, we see that in these more racially biased counties, uh, black owned businesses are more likely to get non-bank PPP loans. And then when we look overall at access to uh, PPP, uh, here we don't find any significant effect or significant interaction uh, between uh, black and uh, racial bias, uh, but the standard errors here are quite large. And so we cannot rule out uh, potentially like negative effects here. Uh, and I should also say that um, right, uh, these regression specifications, they're basically measuring the then uh, still saying that at the average level of bias, there's still this 10 percentage point uh, gap uh, in access to uh, PPP overall for black owned firms. Um, now, one concern that you might have in terms of the interpretation is that um, uh, perhaps our results are due to some unobserved differences in demand for emergency loans. Okay. Now we think that substitution to non-bank sources of uh, PPP loans and to non-forgivable idle loans uh, cuts against the results being due to these unobserved differences in demand. Uh, but it still could be the case that minority-owned restaurants could have been uh, more vulnerable to negative shocks going into the pandemic um, or they were less aware of PPP and so potentially maybe less likely to apply. Okay. Um, in the paper, we offer uh, a number of different solutions to address this concern. Uh, one of them is like looking at uh, to control for activity during the pandemic. Um, the one that I wanna focus here is conditioning on the sample of firms that receive uh, idle advance grants. Um, so this is attractive for a couple of reasons for us. One is that these firms that received idle advance grants, so, the, uh, so they applied for an idle loan and they received uh, uh, a forgivable grant. Um, so the fact that they applied for idle means that, uh, for an idle advance grant, means that they were aware of emergency programs uh, and really should have been aware of PPP if they were aware of idle. Uh, it also means that since they filled out the paperwork for idle, uh, the marginal cost for them to apply for PPP should have been relatively low. Uh, so they should have been aware of the program in position to apply uh, 
the second advantage of looking at idle advance is that uh, the loan, <coughs> sorry, uh, the size of the uh, idle advance grant was basically a mechanical function of the number of employees that you have, and firms received $1,000 per employee uh, up to $10,000. And so based on the uh, size of the idle advance grant, we can back out the number of uh, employees that the firm has and control for the number of employees in our regression of whether the firm received PPP. And so uh, here, what you see is that uh, controlling for the number of employees, so conditioning on getting an idle advance grant and controlling for the number of employees we see that firms that have more employees are more likely to get uh, PPP. And this result is driven by receiving, being more likely to get bank PPP. Um, but sort of controlling for awareness and for payroll uh, doesn't really affect the coefficients on um, uh, black. Uh, and if anything, the estimates here are some actually somewhat larger in magnitude than in the overall sample. Uh, the other concern that you might have is whether, um, you know, is about external validity uh, and whether there's something special about uh, restaurants. Okay. Uh, so naturally, as I said at the beginning, we, like, we don't have, you know, a full population of potential borrowers generally, but we can conduct a similar exercise of conditioning on getting an idle advance grant. So for Florida firms that received idle advance grants, uh, we can ask whether minority-owned businesses were less likely to get uh, PPP loans and uh, bank PPP loans in particular. Okay. Uh, and so what we find is that the answer to this question is yes, and we get very similar results uh, to our restaurant sample, uh, saying that uh, controlling for, for observable firm characteristics, uh, including firm age, sales, number of employees, and existing bank relationships, uh, we find that black owned businesses are about uh, eight to nine percentage points uh, less likely to get uh, PPP loans. Okay. Right. Uh, so uh, just to conclude some concluding thoughts. So we find uh, we show that disparities in access to PPP are likely a manifestation of disparities in bank lending more generally, uh, which have been uh, documented before. I um, think we need to better understand whether these disparities stem from disparities in applications um, or approvals. Uh, it might be that um, minority owned businesses were less likely to apply because they expected to be denied uh, given history of discrimination. Um, and the final point that I wanna make is that while we emphasize the results that control for firm characteristics Right. Um, the design of the program itself may have discouraged uh, bank uh, applications or approvals of smaller, younger firms without bank relationships. Uh, and these are disproportionately uh, minority owned firms. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I uh, look forward to any uh, comments or questions. Okay, thank you. All right, any, any questions on this paper? I have a question on both this paper and Sabrina's paper. Um, is in, in neither paper, do you talk about policy recommendations? Do you have policy recommendation given what you found? Um, we wanted to try to stay away from policy recommendations. Um, I've actually, I've been, I've had uh, working papers shot down by Jim Paterbo when I try to submit them as NVR working papers for having too much policy recommendation in them. So we, um, we, we obviously think the paper has a lot of um, policy relevance. And in particular, I think where it's most relevant is thinking about trade-offs of allowing new FinTech lenders who um, may have higher risks uh, than conventional lenders, maybe less regulated, um, perhaps maybe using black box algorithms that certain sort of parties feel is, is more difficult to understand or may create more discrimination. All of those sort of negatives should be weighed against these benefits that we're finding of automation, that actually there's a really big benefit from removing human decision makers. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and so I think that that's kind of what we're hoping to contribute to the policy debate. 
Thank you. Sergey? Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what um, Sabrina said. I would also say that, right, so um, in terms of our results, right, um, the way that we would sort of like try to think about linking them to policy, right, is in terms of our decomposition of the importance of the different sources of these disparities for, uh, say, Black-owned businesses, right? Uh, and it seems like um, roughly 10 percentage points is differences in farm characteristics, right? And about 10 percentage points is this residual gap, which we think is most likely due to uh, actual discrimination in the process, right? Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, it suggests that, right, like, designing a program to be easier to access um, for smaller businesses would make a big difference and potentially equally large differences, right, uh, compared to also potentially automating the process to get more directly uh, at the racial biases and discrimination in the actual, pro uh, in the actual application process. Thank you. I will say one thing, these papers are also very well done. That there, There's not a lot to pick at on them. I mean, it's just an excellent set of papers. Thank you. Okay, any, any other comments or questions? Okay, all right. Well, thank you all for your attendance and your attention.